Good afternoon, folks. We're here from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. Uh, we're a local Glasgow congregation. We minister in this area, and we meet at Two Thornwood Terrace. That's just up Dumbarton Road, and when you come to the police station, opposite the police station, you will see a hill. Go up the hill, and you will come, first of all, to Thornwood Primary School, and then you will find our building next door to Thornwood Primary School. And we do extend a, a warm welcome to you, that you might come along, and that you might hear something more concerning the Christian gospel. On an occasion like this, there's very limited in what we can do, but we are delighted to be able to come out this afternoon and, if anything, to introduce you to the claims and to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the very sum and substance of Christianity and there would be no Christianity without the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe as we begin our time here, because we're not uh, strangers to Buchanan Street, we have come out on many, many occasions. This is not our, our usual spot, but nevertheless, we are regulars on Buchanan Street. And you may well wonder, why do we come out? Because it is somewhat rare to see a, a minister of religion out on the street declaring the gospel. This is not something that we see in our day and generation. But friends, we have a, a mandate. We have a commission. Who have we got a commission from? Well, we have a commission from the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that he suffered and died. You know he was put into a tomb. But you know that he arose. And he was seen by his disciples for over 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, he gathered his disciples together before he ascended up into heaven. And he gave them a commission, what we call the Great Commission. And I want to read the, the Gospel Commission to you uh, this afternoon. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power in heaven and earth, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. Uh, can I just ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Um, is it, is it through the Jesus was not born on the 25th of December? Yes, that's true. He wasn't, no. So why did you know to tell? Well, we don't. That's, it's not in the Bible. We don't celebrate Christmas. He's not? No. No, we don't because he wasn't born the 25th of December. We know the shepherds would never be out uh, feeding their sheep at, in, in the middle of winter. So, no, definitely not. We don't know when he was born, but we know he was born, and we know why. He came to seek and to save. That's what was lost, and that's what we seek to proclaim this afternoon. You don't celebrate Christmas? No, no, we don't. Why did, we, why did I get to church somebody Christmas? Or was it I don't know, sir. What church did you go to? Uh, church of Scotland. Church of Scotland. Well, some churches do observe the date, but we don't. We don't. Do the, know, the only day we observe do you is know the Lord. Why they changed that? Do you know why they, they, they decided only? Well, that? I think they tried to Christianize uh, a festival that was being was held. The, the Roman, the Roman yeah. solstice. Yeah. Some, I thought that's what it was. And they just tried to Christianize something, but the, there's no biblical warrant for it. The only day that we observe is the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day Sunday, the first day of the week when Jesus rose victorious over the grave. That's the day we observe. That's why we go to church that day. Do you believe that the, the remains they found in Turkey are actually part of Noah's Ark? I can't say about these things. I really don't know. I don't uh, know. Did you, do you know that in 50, 1959 they found remains of the Noah's Ark a visitor centre on that in Turkey? Have they? Well, no. They found a boat shape. 
it's, as soon as I see, I, I seen it. It's, it's on YouTube. Uh -huh. I, knew, I knew it wasn't a deal because it wasn't big enough for a start. That well. was my fact, but. Uh, I, I think I might be annoying you know, so I'll just let you go, right? Okay, sir. Thank you. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And here we have the Great Commission. And this commission was given initially to the early apostles and to the disciples. And they were diligent believers and they did what they could in their day and time, but obviously they could never cover the whole world. And therefore we have taken up that commission as that commission has been given to the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may go forth and preach the gospel. And there are a number of things that we note in these verses that I read earlier to you. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power has been given unto the Lord Jesus Christ. All power, all authority. Do you know, friends, that the Lord Jesus, the one that was crucified and the one that was dead and put into a tomb, is alive and alive forevermore. And what's more, all power and all authority has been given unto King Jesus. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He tells us that all power has been given unto him in heaven and in earth. He is the ultimate ruler in this world. As we have been reminded in recent days, monarchs, kings, queens, presidents and prime ministers, all kinds of rulers come and go. They will go the way of all the earth. They are but flesh. But the Lord Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords forever and forever. And he has an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that cannot be overthrown, and a kingdom that will ultimately be fully visible and the only kingdom in this world. He has all power, we are told, in heaven and in earth. And therefore, as we come out this afternoon, and as we seek to draw to your attention some of the things that we find in the Word of God, we are declaring unto you the Word of the ruler of heaven and earth. He is the ultimate ruler. And therefore, friends, it behoves us that we might give due attention to this word. This word, the gospel that we find in the Holy Bible, is not our word. It does not belong unto the church. It is not ours. It is ultimately the Word of God. And what we have here, therefore, is God's revelation to you and I this afternoon. And therefore, it behoves us that we might give this Word due attention. What is this Word? Well, this Word is the Word of God. It's the Word of our salvation. And what we find in the Gospel is a record of how God has made all things. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is the Creator. We know that many people laugh, and many people despise that today, and many people rely and believe upon the religion called evolution a religion that tells us that all things have come from nothing. Friends, let it be abundantly made clear today, this afternoon, on Buchanan Street in Glasgow, 
that evolution is unscientific nonsense. It is unscientific, unprovable nonsense. Nothing can come from nothing. That, my friends, is a scientific fact. Nothing can come from nothing. And even my basic arithmetic would tell me that 10 times nothing is nothing. 100 times nothing is nothing. 10 million times 10 million times times nothing is nothing. Evolution is a hoax. It's a hoax of the devil. It is what men want to believe. Because, friends, if evolution is true, God has been removed from the picture. But because evolution is not true, God remains firmly in the picture. Because as we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And therefore, God is the one who has created all that we can see. The clouds, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the fish, the birds, the animals, the insects, and ultimately, He is our Creator. He's the one who made us. And we are told in Genesis chapter 2 that He was made in our... We were made in His image. Let us make man in our image. And that's what God did. Out of the dust, He created Adam. And out of Adam, He created Eve. And our first parents were created perfectly. Absolutely perfect. And they were the very pinnacle of God's creation. And when God saw His creation at the end of six days, what was God's verdict upon His own creation? It is all very good. It is all very good. And truly it was good. It was perfect. But something happened. Something happened that changed the creation. Something happened that was momental. Something happened that transformed this world that we know. What happened? Well, basically what happened, our first parents sinned. Our first parents disobeyed a clear and simple commandment that God had given to them. A commandment that would test whether they would be obedient unto Him or not. And they chose not to listen and to be disobedient. And they listened to the evil one and they sided with the evil one. And ever since that time, sin has entered into this world. And that's why we have all the problems that we do have. That's why we have wars. That's why we have famine. That's why we have bad weather. That's why we have tears. That's why we have sickness. That's why we have suffering. That's why we have death. None of these things would be in this world if it were not for the fact that mankind have sinned. And this is very important for us to understand. This, all, this is all part of the message from heaven. This message that tells us is God is the Creator. He has created us. We have fallen and therefore we need to be saved. We're told in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 in the Bible. Read it for yourselves, friends. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This is a message that God declares to us. God reveals to us why we have death, why it happens all the time. It is because of sin. Therefore, this would tell us that this is not a, a light matter. Sin is a very serious matter. 
and it takes God to deal with it. And the Lord Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We go out into the world and we bring to you the message from heaven concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that one who came to seek and to save that which was lost. And this would tell us that when the Lord Jesus Christ came, He came on a mission. He came on a mercy mission. He came in order to save, to save sinners. And that's what we are. We are that because primarily our first parents who were made in the image of God and made upright and perfect, they sinned. And because they sinned, we have inherited their sinful nature. And therefore the Bible tells us today, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's God's verdict. That's God's testimony concerning ourselves. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there, therefore there is an element of bad new, news in the gospel. What is that bad news? The bad news is quite clear that in the sight of God we are sinners. And because we are sinners, we cannot deal with this problem ourselves. That's why Jesus Christ came. He came to seek and to save that, that which was lost. He came to give his life a ransom for many. And that's what he did. And this is wonderful and good news for the, for the people today, for this world, for everyone here who can hear. There is hope. We know that we're sinners by nature and sinners by practice. And we know that the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And this problem of sin is such a great problem that we cannot deal with it. We might try to, and many do. Many come to that point in their experience when they recognize that they're not right with God, they recognize that they're not fit to meet God and they are anxious about eternity. They're anxious about where they will spend eternity and they know they're not right with God and they try to get themselves right with God. They might try to do a, a number of good works. They might turn charitable. They might even become religious and start to attend a place of worship. But all of these things, either individually or combined, cannot save us. They cannot get us right with God. All of these things cannot get a sinner right with the Holy God. And then you may well be asking me, how can I get right with God? If, as what the Bible says, that I am a sinner and God is a holy God, how then can a sinner and a holy God be reconciled? It is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only mediator or the only go-between between sinful mankind and a holy God. As the Bible says in 1 Timothy, read it for yourselves, it says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And here is the answer to mankind's greatest need. Here is 
God's answer to mankind's greatest plight? How can I have my sins forgiven? How can I be made right with God? Well, the only way, friends, this can happen is by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only hope for mankind. He is the, the only God-appointed Savior. He himself did say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And there he was telling his disciples that no one will get to heaven or no one can be reconciled to God by their own actions or by religion or by any other way other than coming through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is absolutely unique. It is Christ that makes Christianity unique. There is no individual like him. None has ever come down from heaven except the Son of Man who was in heaven. Christianity is God's response to mankind's greatest need. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And this would remind us, if ever we need to be reminded, that Jesus did not come to destroy men's lives. He did not come to be a conqueror. He did not come to be a ruler. He did not come to be a judge. He came to save. He came to save. Now, who did he come to save? He came to save sinners. Who are sinners, friends? Who are the sinners? Well, the Bible doesn't flatter us. It tells us clearly, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Read it for yourselves. Pick up your Bibles. Read the Word of God. Hear God speaking to you. And it will tell you that we are sinners. And because we're sinners, what do we need? What do we need above all things? We need to have a Savior. We need to be saved from our sins. We need to be saved from the, the guilt that sin brings to us. Maybe this is something you've not considered. But you carry around with you a guilty conscience. We might call it in modern parlance, you carry around with you a burden. You have a burden on you. And you don't really know where it came from. And maybe you cannot describe what it is. And sometimes it's more evident than other times. But you carry with you this burden. And there are occasions when this burden will manifest itself. There may be times when you're sick or when bereavement visits your family or your home and you become more and more aware of your mortality and you have a burden, something that's bothering you, something that's troubling you. What is that burden? That burden, my friends, is your sin. And you have this burden because this burden will stop you having fellowship and communion with the living God. And in order for that relationship to be restored, something must happen. That burden must be taken from you. How can that burden possibly be taken from you? You might well ask me. Well, it's only through the Lord Jesus, because that burden is your sin. Every one of us has it by nature, because we are sinners by nature. 
And because we're sinners, God cannot look upon us. The Bible describes God like this, who is of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look upon iniquity. That's, that's the God of the Bible. A God who is absolutely pure and holy. And He cannot and He will not tolerate sin. Sin is offensive unto God. What is sin? You might well ask me. Sin is any want of or transgression of the law of God. Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. And basically, friends, sin is to break God's law or not to fulfill God's law. And therefore, God has given us a law, and it is summarized in the Ten Commandments. You've heard of them. Maybe you might know some of them. Let me quote the first commandment to you, the first commandment that God has given to us. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We are to worship the one true and the living God. The God that we know in some sense by nature. Because God has revealed this to us internally. So that we are without excuse, the Bible would tell us in Romans chapter 1. It tells us that God has revealed Himself to us in creation. And we know that the God of the Bible exists because of what we see in creation. But more than that, God has given us something else. He has revealed Himself internally in our conscience where we have a sense of right and wrong. And this has come to us because we are made in the image of God. And one of the commandments that God has given us to obey is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now you might well say, Well, I haven't broken that commandment. I don't have any other gods. But is that really so? Is that the case? What is a God, for instance? We might think that a God is something like a statue or an idol that we worship, as some of the primitive tribes do even today. But a God is more than that. A God is anything that takes the place, rightly due, to the one true and the living God. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what we find in the Bible. That's how Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength, and we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. What do you love? Where are your affections placed upon today? If we are to love the Lord our God, let me ask you then, have you really kept the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is it not true that more than likely you love yourself more than anything else in this world? 
you got up in this morning and you had your breakfast, you had a shower, you maybe got ready for work, you took a train or a bus or the car or walked or whatever, you went to your work, maybe you had your lunch. Did you ever consider God at all in the day, in this day? Have you given God any thought at all? Have you thanked Him for life, for health, for strength? Have you thanked Him for the food you eat, for the water you drink, for the clothes you wear, for your family, for your friends, for your job, for your money? Have you acknowledged God at all in your life? The likelihood is that you haven't acknowledged Him at all. And therefore, friends, I put it to you that you have broken the first commandment. For the first commandment tells us where thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we could go through all the other commandments. And if we knew what they meant and their application, we would have to conclude that we've broken every single one of these commandments. What about the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. Have you taken the Lord's name in vain today? Have you said, O oh God, O oh Lord, have you said Jesus Christ without a true reference to him? Then you have broken the third commandment. In recent days, have we not listened to uh, the new king, King Charles III? If I've got the incident right, he was using a pen, and the pen was somewhat faulty. And did he not take the name of the Lord his God in vain when he was there talking about the faulty pen? Friends, it's something that we hear time and time again in the street, in the shops, in the media, even in the playground, the Lord's name is taken in vain. That's a breach of the third commandment. We are to realize that the Lord's name is holy and it is to be used reverently and appropriately. We could think of another commandment. What about the seventh commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. What about this today? Is this not a commandment that has been broken continually? How many people commit fornication? How many people commit adultery? How many people commit homosexuality? All are a breach of the seventh commandment. But the Lord Jesus Christ and the great Sermon on the Mount, he reminds us that if we are to look at someone in a lustful manner, that is to commit adultery. We don't need to actually physically commit adultery to commit adultery and to break the seventh commandment. You see, the commandments are not just concerned about what we do with our hands and our feet and our bodies. The commandments also cover our words and our actions and our very thoughts. Thou shalt not kill is the sixth commandment. And I'm sure that as I'm talking here to many people who are passing by, that they've never committed murder in their lives, and they're not likely to. But again, the Lord Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that if we hate someone without a cause, then we are guilty of a breach of that commandment. You see, 
You can break the commandments by your thoughts and by your words. That's the breadth of them. That's the application of them. And the more that we look at God's commandments and the more that we understand them, the more that we have to come to the realization that we are sinners in the sight of God. And sin has a hold upon us. Sin has a grip upon us. And we need to be saved from our sins. How then can we be saved? The only way to be saved, friends, is to put your faith and your hope and your trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that one who is the friend of sinners, the one who came to save sinners and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's why we come out this afternoon in order to introduce to you the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to take a short break, but we do ask that God might be pleased to bless unto you His Word this afternoon. Good afternoon, folks. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. It's an absolute delight and privilege to be able to stand here and to tell you something concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and to direct you to Him. We are a Scottish registered charity. We're a local congregation. We minister in the area and we do invite you along to our services. We meet at 2 Thornwood Terrace. That's up Dumbarton Road. And when you come to the police station, opposite there, you'll go up a hill and you'll come to Thornwood Primary School. And next to Thornwood Primary School, you'll find our building at the crossroads. We extend a warm welcome to you. Come along any Lord's Day, that's Sunday, 11 a.m., or again at 6 p.m., or our Wednesday prayer meeting at 7.30. And you would be made most welcome. And there you might hear something more concerning uh, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, we come out and we leave our church buildings behind. We leave our pulpit behind. We come out because there is a great need today. There is so much ignorance concerning what Christianity is all about. Christianity, friends, is about a person. It's about the Son of God. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ the eternally begotten Son of God who came down from heaven in order to seek and to save that which was lost. And because we are sinners by nature and sinners by practice, this description of being lost applies to every one of us. And that's why we can, can come out in the street and we can we can proclaim the same gospel to everyone. It matters little concerning the color of your skin. It doesn't matter about your sex, whether you be male or female. It does not matter about your social standing. It does not matter about your upbringing or your education or whatever position in life you have managed to attain to. We're all guilty in this respect before the living God. He tells us in His Word, the Bible, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, we've all missed the mark. And because God is a God of absolute perfection, who alone is holy and pure, we cannot therefore have fellowship with Him and we cannot have communion with Him until something is done about this great problem of sin. And this is why we come out, friends, because God in His grace, God in His wonderful love that He has displayed 
towards mankind has done something about our greatest need. He has done something. What has He done? He has sent forth Jesus. Now, you may well be asking, how can Jesus save? What has He done in order that He might be able to save sinners? Well, friends, we'll seek to try to tell you. You must listen and you must grasp this. Jesus came to this world to live, first of all, a perfect life. None of us has lived a perfect life. But Jesus, and Jesus alone, has lived a perfect life. He has fulfilled God's law perfectly. God has given mankind a law. It is comprehended or summed up in the Ten Commandments. He has given these commandments to us. And He tells us we are to live according to these commandments. But the problem is, because we're sinners, we cannot keep these commandments. It is impossible for us because of sin. But Jesus came and He lived a perfect life. He never committed any sin. He did no wrong actions. He never spoke an evil or a sinful word. He never had an impure or sinful thought. He was absolutely perfect. And therefore, He was able, when He went to Calvary's tree, and we'll talk about that later, but when He went to Calvary's tree, He offered up a perfect sacrifice, an absolutely perfect, blemish-free sacrifice in order to satisfy the just demands of God's most holy law. Now, why did He go to the cross? Well, the Bible tells us the soul that sins shall die. And that applies to us all. That's why there is death in this world. It is because of sin. But ultimately, friends, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And what that means is, ultimately, if our sins are not dealt with, we will die eternally we will die what's called the second death. What is the second death? The second death is to be eternally separated from the gracious presence of God forever. That's the second death. Now Jesus paid the price of mankind breaking God's law. He paid that price. He suffered. He died. There on Calvary's tree, He suffered the pains of hell. Why? Because He was our substitute. The law says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Jesus died in our room and in our place as a substitute. And therefore, He satisfied all the requirements of God's law. He perfectly kept God's law. As I said to you a moment or two ago, He kept it perfectly. And what's more, He paid the penalty for mankind breaking God's law. He suffered death. He suffered the pains of hell on behalf of His people. And therefore, friends, we present to you this afternoon in our gospel proclamation, we present a person, a person who has lived a perfect life and who has offered up a perfect sacrifice. And how do we know? How do we know that this was acceptable to God? How do we know? Well, we know, friends, because he was put in the tomb on the Friday evening. He was there Friday night. He was there all day Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath. But on the first day of the week, He arose. He arose. That tells us that God accepted His work. God accepted what He did on Calvary's tree. 
and he has provided an atonement, a way, by, a way whereby we can be reconciled to God. And God proved that his work was acceptable by raising Christ from the dead on the third day. And this is something else that you need to hold on to concerning real, authentic, biblical Christianity. We proclaim to you a Savior who is alive. Too many people think that Jesus is in a, in a manger or He's on a cross or He's in a tomb. All of these things are were historically true. That is true. But they're no longer relevant in one sense because the Savior we proclaim to you this afternoon is alive and alive forevermore. He sits at God's right hand even today. And He's waiting for that time when He shall return. Yes, this is the, this is the next great event in God's calendar, we might say. The return of the Lord Jesus. And we know the Bible tells us that scoffers will come in the latter days. I'm going to read one or two verses from 2 Peter chapter 3. Here Peter is talking about the last days. And he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, Verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Many people laugh and many people scoff when you tell them that Jesus will return. They are the scoffers that have been predicted and prophesied about in the Bible. Peter tells us that scoffers shall come in the latter days. Where is His coming? Well, friends, we don't know when He will come. We don't know, but we know He will come. And the very fact that there are people today laughing at the coming of the Lord Jesus tells us and reminds us that the Bible is true. It is abundantly true. Clear, steadfast, true. Scoffers will come. And that is the next great event in God's calendar. The day when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return in power and in glory. And we ask you, friends, are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day when you will see Him? And every eye shall see Him, the Bible tells us. You can read it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him. Every eye. There'll be no exceptions. He will come on that great and glorious day. So Christianity is all about a person. It's all about a person who has come, a person who has worked out a, a way whereby sinners can be reconciled to God. And we come out this afternoon and we introduce this person to you that you might put your faith and your hope and your trust upon Him. And you have a wonderful warrant to believe upon Him. You know, friends, if you read the Bible, you will find that Jesus did not turn anyone away. Whoever is truly penitent, whoever truly believes and is repentant, the Lord Jesus Christ will not turn away. We go back to His crucifixion. We go back to that time when He was crucified with two thieves. 
And at one point during the crucifixion, the two thieves railed upon Christ. They were, they were abusive to Him. But suddenly, all of, a, all of a sudden, one of the thieves began to look upon the Lord Jesus in a different manner. And he said to his fellow thief, Dost thou not fear God, seeing we are in the same condemnation? And this thief then turned to the Lord Jesus and said to him, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And here was a thief, and he was more than a thief, because he would not be crucified if he was simply a thief. He was therefore more than likely a violent or murderous individual. And therefore, we might say he was beyond hope. But this person who was a murderer and a thief and a violent robber, he turns to the Lord Jesus moments before he's about to die, and he says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What do you think the Lord Jesus said to him? The Lord said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. In other words, he was going to be saved. His sins would be forgiven. He would be reconciled to God. And he would be found in paradise when he died. Did the Lord Jesus Christ reject him? Did the Lord Jesus scold him? No, he did not. He accepted him. And it's the same for every one of us, friends. If we will but turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, if we repent, what does that mean? It means to turn our backs upon our sins. If we will but turn our backs upon our old life, upon our sins, we will find that Christ will receive us. He will be merciful unto us. We are therefore to repent and we're to believe the gospel. We're to believe the record concerning the Lord Jesus. We are to believe that He is the only begotten Son of God. We are to believe that He is the one who has been sent down from heaven on a mercy mission in order to seek and to save that which was lost. We are to believe that He is the Son of God, and we are to believe that His work on Calvary's tree was indeed the work of God, and that through believing upon His name, we shall be saved. So friends, it's a pleasure to be out this afternoon, to be able to say something concerning uh, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus, and we invite you to come and receive Him as your Lord and as your Savior, and to have the knowledge that your sins are forgiven and that you are reconciled to God. We're going to take a short break and recharge our batteries, but may God be pleased to bless His Word to you this afternoon. Good afternoon. We're here from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We're a local congregation. We meet at Two Thornwood Terrace, just off Dumbarton Road. You'll come to the police station, and opposite the police station, there's a hill. Please go up the hill, and you'll come first of all to Thornwood Primary School, and we are next door at the crossroads. And we give you a warm welcome. Come along any Lord's Day, that Sunday at 11 a.m., or again at 6 p.m. And we also meet on Wednesday at 7.30 for a prayer meeting. And you will be made most welcome to these meetings. Come along. Maybe you've not been to church for some time, or maybe you've never been to church at all, and maybe you're, you might be somewhat apprehensive. Well, please do not be apprehensive. We're used to welcoming visitors, and we would extend a warm welcome 
to you all every Lord's Day, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m., or Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. You know, someone has criticized me that I'm out here wearing a clerical collar. Well, I'm here, friends, because officially I am a, a minister of religion, and I wear a clerical collar on an occasion like this, and I have a bright blue shirt in order that people might distinguish me from the, the Jehovah Witnesses and other cults because they are not real, genuine Christians. And I'm happy to wear the clerical collar because when people see the clerical collar, it tells them instantly that this man here is a minister of religion. It doesn't tell, tell them that I'm orthodox or whether I'm good or whether I'm bad, but it does tell them that at least I am a minister of religion. And that's why I wear it, in order that people might instantly associate me with a, a Christian church. And we are at pains to stress that we proclaim Christ and Him crucified. We preach Christ and Him crucified. We do mention our, our congregation. We give our address. We give our details. Again, that people might realize we're not fly-by-night characters. Instead, that they would realize we are genuine Christians, a genuine local congregation, and all our details will be found on the tracks that people are handing out. In other words, we're not ashamed of who we are, and we're not ashamed of whom we proclaim. We are proclaiming Christ and Him crucified, and He has given us a commission. And what is that commission? It's the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and teach and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you until the end of the age. So friends, we are not proclaiming ourselves. We are proclaiming another because the great God that we have to deal with, and whether we like it or not, that day will come when we will go the way of all the earth, and we shall be gathered to our fathers. That day will come when we will go into eternity, and on that day we will have an audience with God. And therefore, it is our desire and plea this afternoon that we might make you aware that that day is coming and that you might be prepared for that day. And indeed, you may wonder, how can you possibly be prepared for that day? The only way that you can be prepared to meet God is to have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. In other words, friends, God is a holy God. He is a sin-hating God. And we're going to meet Him. And by nature, all of us are sinners. And therefore, we are utterly unprepared to meet Him. And the only way that we can be prepared is to have a Savior. And that Savior is Christ. Now, how can He possibly save us? Well, He can save us because He has lived a perfect life. None of us lives a perfect life. But the Lord Jesus Christ, who was conceived miraculously in the womb of the Virgin Mary, so that He did not contract original sin, so that when He was born, in the normal manner. He was born without sin, and he lived a perfect life. He never had uh, impure thought. 
He never spoke a wrong word. He never had to apologize. He never committed a sinful act. All the days of his life, he lived a perfect life. And therefore, in all part of God's plan of redemption, in order to save people, he was able to offer up himself as a sacrifice, as a perfect sacrifice to satisfy a perfect God. And what's more, he paid the price for mankind's sin. You see, sin has a price. We might think that sin is delightful, and indeed for a time when we engage in sin, it pleases us, it delights us, but there's a sting in sin, for the wages of sin is death. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And therefore, friends, because we're all sinners, we're all destined to die, not just, not just physically, but the second death. Unless something's done about it, we will die the second death. And what is the second death? The second death, friends, is to be separated from the gracious presence of God for all eternity. That's what the second death is. And therefore, we have to be saved. And Jesus Christ therefore died and paid the price in our room and in our place. And because He lived a perfect life, and because He offered up Himself as a sacrifice to make atonement for man's sin, we are able this afternoon to come out and to address the people on Buchanan Street in Glasgow and to tell them there is a Savior. There is a Savior who can save to the uttermost. There is a Savior who can save you from all your sins, from every sin, every sin you've ever committed. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to save. And we do not want to keep this news to ourselves. We want to come out and to tell all because this is something that affects all of us without exception, because the Bible makes abundantly clear, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, it doesn't matter where we have been born, it doesn't matter the color of our skin, it doesn't matter how wise we are, or how bright we are, or how well off we are, it doesn't matter about our upbringing or our social status. As far as God is concerned, we are one in this sense. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, young or old, male or female, we've all sinned. Every one of us, and we'll all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give account on that day. The Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian Christians, he tells them, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do you know this, friends? Do you realize this? Has this hit home that one day you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ? You know, today, today you might live without Christ. You might reject Christ. You might not think about Him. You might live as if you're going to live forever. But friends, the Bible tells us one day, one day you'll stand before Him. One day you'll see Him in all His glory. And one day you'll give account. You'll give account of your thoughts. You'll give account of your words. You'll give account of your actions. And you'll stand before Jesus who knows all things. The Bible talks about the day when books shall be opened. What is that a reference to? 
It's a reference to your conscience. It's a reference to your mind. It's a reference to your memory. One day, everything that you've ever thought, everything that you've ever said, and everything that you've ever done will be fully known. And you'll stand before King Jesus and give account. How will you manage? How will you fare on that day? Will you be declared guilty or will you go free on that day? Well, men, women, boys, girls, we're out here this afternoon in order that you might be prepared for that day. How can you possibly be prepared for that day? The only way to be prepared is to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to have Him who fulfilled God's law on your behalf, to have Him who paid the penalty for breaking God's law on your behalf, to have His righteousness given to you. That's what we're out to tell you. And this can be yours. How can it possibly be yours? It is yours by receiving Christ. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ has a, has a people, a people that has been given to him by the Father. A people from all eternity has been given to the Father to the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people will come to Him. And they will come to Him as they hear the Gospel. And that's why we come out this afternoon and we preach the Gospel indiscriminately. And we tell all people to come to the Lord Jesus. Does He not say Himself, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There we have a gospel invitation extended to us by the Lord Jesus Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you troubled by life? Are you troubled by your sin? Then come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Have your sins forgiven. Receive the gift of eternal life. Be prepared for glory. That's the only way, friends, that you can be right with God. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And here's a wonderful part of that verse. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He will turn none away. If you will but come to the Lord Jesus, if you will cast yourself upon his mercy, you will receive mercy. He is merciful, who is a God like unto thee, the Bible says, that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. That's the God of the Bible. He delighteth in mercy. He does not delight in the death of the wicked. Instead, he has made provision in order that all might be saved. What must we do to be saved, friends? We must come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must call upon him. You know, in the New Testament times, Paul and Silas, his companion, were in Philippi. And they were the ones who had brought the gospel first to Europe. And because Paul was a faithful gospel preacher, he was put into prison along with his 
companion Silas. And the authorities thought that he presented such a great threat to the community that the jailer was given instructions. Put this man in the most securest place in the prison. And there he was in the very center of the prison, in chains, locked up, because he had preached the gospel. And in prison, he was singing the Psalms himself and Silas. And at midnight, there came an earthquake. And as a result of the earthquake, the prisoners' bonds were broken and the doors of the prison were opened. And the prison officer thought it was curtains for him. He imagined that all the prisoners had escaped. And he came in to the Apostle Paul and Silas, and he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And what did the Apostle Paul tell him? Did the Apostle Paul tell him, go to church? Did the Apostle Paul tell him to give money? Did the Apostle Paul tell him to, to be a charitable individual? No. The Apostle Paul told him to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, you and your household. And that, that very moment, the Philippian jailer believed upon the Lord Jesus, and the Apostle Paul brought the gospel to him. And friends, this is what we must do to be saved, to be saved from our sins, to be saved from the guilt, to be saved from the pollution, and ultimately to be saved from the presence of sin. We must believe. We must call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must have Him as our Lord and as our Savior. And this is why we come out this afternoon in order that you might hear something concerning the authentic Christian gospel. Because today, in the day that we're living in, many people might go to places of worship. And indeed, there are many, many places of worship. And some of them are not good at all. In fact, it would be better not to go there at all. But we come out, friends, in order that we might be able to proclaim to you something concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. And this, as the Bible says, is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the Apostle Paul says, of whom I am the chief. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland continuing. And with a local congregation, with a Scottish registered charity, and we invite you along to our services at 2 Thornwood Terrace. That's up Dumbarton Road, and you'll come to the police station. Opposite the police station, go up the hill, and you'll first of all come to Thornwood Primary School. Then you will meet our building next door at the crossroads. Come along any Lord's Day, Sunday at 11 a.m. or 6 p.m., or indeed Wednesday at 7.30. And we extend a warm welcome to you to come with us and be with us during any of these, these days and times. It's good to be here, folks, to preach the everlasting gospel and to proclaim in some manner and in some measure the unsearchable riches of Christ and to introduce to you the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and to remind you that there is a day coming when He shall return in power and in glory. And when He returns, this world that we know it shall end. You know, there's people around today, and we'll call them environmentalists, 
we'll call them people who are concerned about climate change or global warming or whatever. And they're trying to tell us that because of man's behavior, the climate is changing. And if we don't change our behavior, it's basically curtains for uh, the creation. That's what they're trying to tell us and they're trying to scare us with these things. We don't believe these things for a moment. We believe that the climate, the weather is in the hands of Almighty God as it has always been. And we remind ourselves of the glorious promise that God has given Noah after the flood that destroyed the old world. He reminds us in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22 of this promise that he gave. And let me read it to you. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And that promise has stood the test of time for thousands of years and it will continue until that time when the Lord Jesus Christ shall return in power and in glory. And when he returns, friends, it will be curtains for this world. What will happen? Well, a number of things will happen. First, this world as we know it shall be destroyed by fire. Second, Peter chapter 3 tells us the ancient world was destroyed by water, but this present world is reserved to be destroyed by fire. And God will make a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There will be the resurrection. When Christ comes, every person that has ever lived and died shall be brought to life. Their bodies shall be reconstituted. Whether the body was burnt or whether the body was buried in a, a grave and it turned to dust, it matters little. The day will come when the body shall be reconstituted at the resurrection. And because all shall be made alive again, there shall be that terrible, dreadful day of judgment that I spoke about earlier. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And the apostle therefore goes on to say, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men. And in some way we seek to walk in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, and we seek to warn people. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. This is what we seek to do. We seek to persuade you that there is a day coming, a day when you shall be judged, when you'll give account a day, friends, that if you're not found having your sins forgiven and having a Savior on that day, it will be a terrible day. Why will it be a terrible day? Because those who do not have Christ as their Lord and Savior will be cast into a place that the Bible calls hell. Now, you might go to church. You might go to a, a Christian place of worship and you might never hear about hell. But friends, do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke more about hell than he did about heaven? That's remarkable, but it's true. If you look at all the references that are found in the Bible, you will find that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And therefore, friends, we seek to warn you there is a way to escape because by nature, by default, we're all on that broad road 
that leads to destruction. We're all on that road that unless we are born again, unless we are changed, unless we are converted, we will end up in that terrible place called hell or the bottomless pit. And that's why we come out this afternoon to tell you there is another way. There's the way of the cross. There's the way of taking up the cross and following the Lord Jesus. And that's what we're urged to do. And the Bible tells us that God has no delight in the death of the wicked. Say unto them, we find in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? He's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to faith. He's calling us to turn our backs upon our sinful lives, to turn away from our sins, to turn away from our greed, to turn away from our debauchery, to turn away from our false religion, to turn away from our lies, to turn away from our stealing, to turn away from our adultery and fornication and homosexuality, turn away from our sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's required of us. And if we are to be declared righteous on that great day of judgment, we need to have a Savior. And that Savior is none other than Jesus. Neither is there salvation found in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Christ alone can save. No one else can save. The minister cannot save you. The priest cannot save you. Muhammad cannot save you. Only the Lord Jesus. Therefore, come to Him. Believe upon Him. Cast yourselves upon His mercy. We're going to close our time. And may God be pleased to bless to you His Word this afternoon. God willing, if we're fit and able, we'll be back. May the Lord bless His Word to you, therefore, this afternoon.